Hello there. My name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. From my experiences as an angling filmmaker with well over a hundred videos covering a diverse range of topics on both YouTube and the Fishing Films and Facts website, I've been able to accurately monitor viewing pattern preferences by the numbers of hits each video receives, and as such, have a pretty good handle on just exactly what it is that most anglers particularly want to know about. As you'd expect, this splits into two distinct categories, with the preferences of freshwater anglers being completely different to those fishing in the sea. Far and away, the two main viewing categories amongst sea anglers are on-water boat demonstrations and anything at all to do with gathering, keeping or using bait. So with the latter in mind, I'm now in the company of sea bait specialist Dave Christie from Fleetwood, hopefully to tap into his extensive knowledge on the subject of intertidal marine worms. Before getting stuck into the finer detail, would he prefer to be called a bait digger or a bait gatherer? A bait digger. Increasingly these days, it's becoming possible to buy in almost any conceivable variety of sea bait, either fresh or frozen. That said, the mainstay not only for bait diggers, but for anglers too, has, and probably always will be worms, and in particular lugworms, making this the obvious place then to start. When I first took up sea fishing back in the 1960s, marine biologists were adamant that there was only one species of lugworm. The fact that anglers thought otherwise by digging, keeping and using black and blow lug in totally different ways cut no ice whatsoever with the scientists. So in an attempt to settle the issue once and for all, having completed my bachelor's degree at Liverpool, I drew up plans to undertake a genetic investigation into black and blow lug speciation, only to find that Cadman and Nelson Smith at the University of Swansea had already started the same project a year or so earlier, giving them subject priority. So that, as they say, was that. And as predicted, they concluded that the two were indeed totally distinct and separate species, vindicating sea anglers' long-held views. But maybe it doesn't end there, because those who are familiar with black lug make a further as yet scientifically unrecognised subdivision, that being between so-called true black lug and skellies or yellowtails. My first question, therefore, has to be, have you noticed any differences between the two? And if so... Can you explain to us what those differences are? Black lug is obviously, as its name uh, suggests, it is completely black and it can be anything from probably 5 inches up to maybe 18 inches long. The skellies are sometimes called fresh outs, they're sometimes called yellow tails and the reason they call that is it's the same with the black worm and the skellies of the fresh outs. They have iodine in them and when you kill them a yellow liquid comes out of them, which is the iodine, and you'll find that your hands and your fingernails are actually stained yellow and your fingernails are actually stained black. So that's where the yellow tail name comes from. They are, I think, and I believe, a form of black worm because when you actually kill them or when you prick the head of the worm and insert it on the hook, the worm itself will go hard and firm just like a black worm. So I do believe that they are a form of the black worm species and when you actually kill them and place them in newspaper overnight the whole worm will turn from brown to black. And are there any particular physical differences that you've noticed? The way to differentiate between the two worms is that the yellow tails are either browny or reddy coloured occasionally black coloured but they're a lot smaller than the black worms and can be anything from sort of two or three inches long up to probably six seven maybe even eight inches long the black worm as its name indicates is jet black and can be anything from five six inches long up to probably as long as 18 inches or even bigger what about specific environmental preferences which might set the two apart you tend to get a lot of the skellies they seem to live in front of where the black beds are. The black beds are mainly within the first 100 yards of water of the low water mark. You can get the skellies anything from 500 yards back from the water's edge. But having said that, they also seem to breed together and they do live in the same bait bed areas, but possibly not in the same sort of numbers. Might it then just be that skellies are juvenile black lugworms waiting to progress further down the beach to the main beds as they mature, or possibly even within species variation? Uh, That could be the case because a lot of the bait diggers think that the 
brown coloured worms, the skellies, the fresh outs, are in fact immature black worms before they've actually turned black. So that is a correct assumption. And what about the way each needs to be treated and looked after once you've got them out of the sand? Are there any noticeable differences there? In the winter time, I can keep the uh, skellies for a maximum of two weeks. I usually keep them in seawater in the fridge and change the seawater probably every day or every other day. In the summer time, it's harder to keep the yellowtails because of the atmospheric conditions, mainly because of the warm temperatures and these worms seem to find it better to live at, at depth in cooler sort of temperature. So when you bring them from their natural environment, they tend to explode and blow. So I have to get them home as quickly as possible, keep them in fresh seawater in the fridge, but I have to check them daily, change the water daily, and any that have got bloody noses which have died or any that have um, I've injured with the pump, I have to extract them from the ones that are intact and either use them immediately for fishing or freeze them down immediately, whereas the live ones I can keep in the sea water in summer for probably no longer than maybe four or five days. I suppose the most important question for anglers is, are there any differences in their appeal to the fish, either when used fresh or frozen? In using them fresh, no, because you use the black worms as it was dug that day or certainly within the next few days. The same applies to the yellowtails. But in regards freezing, I only freeze down black worms because um, I don't freeze down any yellowtails or any skellies. To become a thinking angler, I think what you've got to do is take a variety of baits with you, and the same applies with worms. I think if you're going fishing, what you have to do is take some live yellowtails or skellies you also have to take some fresh black and then you also have to take some frozen black because what you can do is, although you might have three different sorts of worms, which you would think would be three different sorts of baits, you could actually do cocktails and if you had frozen black, fresh black and live yellowtails, you can actually make nine different cocktails until you find out what the fish are feeding on. Is there any particular reason for not wanting to freeze skellies? Because some bait diggers most certainly do, I know because I've had them, and to me, they don't come out of the freezing process particularly well. They're not as strong as the true black worms because I think they're immature and I think that they are eventually will become black worms. They haven't seemed to have the same resilience or the same strength in the bodies. So the, the bodies don't appear to be as strong as the black worms. To wind up the speciation debate then, do you think that skellies and black lug possibly could end up as separate species, as was the case with black and blow lug? Or would you be putting your money on maturity variation within the one species? Well, no one has been able to determine whether they are different species. Many people have tried, and certainly with regards to blow lug, which is now farmed, and ragworm, which is now farmed, but they've never been able to farm either the blackworm or the yellowtails. So I cannot answer that question until someone actually finds a process of farming the blackworms and the yellowtails. So, we've explored the similarities and differences between black lug and skellies. But what about the differences between black lug and blow lug from a locating, gathering and keeping point of view? Blow lug tend to be in the first 500 yards of the beach. They're very close to the high water mark. In summertime, you can find thousands and thousands, like on my local beach, which I've been on today. There's literally thousands, hundreds of casts, and they're all, all amassed together. Whereas in winter time, the blow lug tends to thin out because a lot of them hibernate. And you will, although you'll find some, there are nowhere near as many casts. They're isolated and, and few and far between. They are not at the same depth as the yellowtails and the blackworm. The blow lug tend to be usually in the first 12 inches of sand. Certainly very easy to dig in the summer. A lot harder in the winter when they also go down to depth. The yellowtails and the blackworms, they live at the low water mark. So the blackworms tend to be in the first 100 yards from the water down to the water's edge itself. The yellowtails appear to be a bit further back, maybe up to 500 yards back from the water's edge. In summertime, these worms sometimes are not at great depth. You can get them probably within the first 6 to 8 inches of sand, Likewise with the blow lug, when it gets colder and in winter time, these worms tend to go to greater depths and maybe as deep as two foot. 
collection of them again is similar to blow lug in the summertime you can get hundreds and thousands of black worms and yellowtails whereas in winter time because of the nature of winter and the cold the colder times then the worms tend to thin out a bit and are not as easy to gather and sometimes in winter you have to wait till low water till the tide's actually coming in before you can get quite a few casts to get enough worms to go fishing with they also differ in the types of burrows they make a blow lug lives in a u-shaped burrow so when you're digging it with the fork it could be at the top of the burrow the middle of the burrow or even at the side where the blow hole is because the way to find the cast is the worm has a blow hole which obviously it breathes through and then it also has a cast that is the sand that's expunged from the body when they've been feeding and it could be anywhere in that u-shaped burrow the black worm and the yellowtail will always live in a vertical burrow in the vertical tube of that burrow the worm could be anywhere from near the surface of the sand or down to a maximum in winter time probably as deep sometimes as two and a half feet. In that respect then, blow lug have little or no chance of escape as the burrows have a fixed depth, whereas black lug and skellies can head downwards when alarmed by any activity above them. In summer time that's uh, definitely that's an affirmative, but in winter time what tends to happen with both sorts of worms, the yellow tails and the black worm, the blow lug also go to great depth because of the coldness, and sometimes you'll find that instead of going maybe only 12 inches, that's one spit with the fork, you might have to go two spits down, that's 24 inches, or even greater to get the blow lug out. And it's the same thing applies to the black in winter time, they are at greater depth, and you might be going down as deep as 20 inches on the shaft of your pump to get these worms out. What about distribution on a national basis? Blow lug appear to be very widespread around all the country. What's the situation with black lug and skellies? Blow lug, I would say, yes, there's blow lug all over the country. I don't think there's black and yellow tails all over the country because they live in certain areas. Different parts of the country haven't got any yellow tail beds or any black beds, but most parts of the country seem to have blow lug beds. What is it then that makes one particular beach as opposed to others attractive enough for black lug to establish a bed? Are there perhaps some types or salinity preferences which first need to be met? Uh, in a word, no, <laughs> because where I live, the black and yellow tail beds uh, go from Knot End all along the River Wire to Fleetwood, and then from Russell Point at Fleetwood all the way along the stretch right through to Russell, Cleveland, Anchor's Home, Norbreck, Blackpool, Lytham, uh, St Anne's, uh, all the way around to Southport, and then right through to Wales, but from certain parts of Lancaster up to Scotland on the same coastline there aren't any black beds with the exception of Barrow so I can't give you a reason as to whether it's the sand, the location, the fact that it's uh, different makeups of the uh, seabeds whether it's close to estuaries or not I can't answer that question. To get black lug and skellies out of the burrows potentially there are two very different options available. The old-fashioned way was to dig them with a purpose-made spade, whereas today, most anglers use a pump. Both have the plus and minus points. Let's then take a look at each in turn, then compare and contrast the two in terms of turnover and potential environmental impact, starting with the digging. Uh, well, I think anyone can dig blow lug, because anyone can get a fork and dig in the garden and turn, turn it over, so I don't think blow lug is an acquired skill I think anyone so long as you're reasonably fit anyone can dig blow lug regarding black that's far and the yellow tails that's far more skilled because you need certainly a few months of practice on how to get the black and the yellow tails out because it's a question of the pump although it's quite powerful and it's got lots of suction in it you've firstly got to know how to use the pump in the sand uh, it's not just a question of ramming the pump in you've got to uh, literally gently push it in and suck at the same time it's a question of getting the hands working at the same speed a bit like a concertina or pulling a piece of string you've got to get your hands working in unison one slowly pushes the pump in while the other slowly sucks the pump out but when they're deep and these worms can move very fast because they have water shoots they have nine jets on each side of the body and that's how they use to propel themselves through the sand and once they sense the pump on the top of the sand or going into the sand they can move really fast 
and sometimes you've got to pump exceedingly fast to get these worms out because they can move at a fantastic rate of knots. Presumably then, there's little point in going in again and again as you see some people doing with the pump if you don't get the worm in, say, the first couple of pulls. Usually, if you don't get the yellowtail or the black worm on the first pump, I would say you're wasting your time and energy and you may as well go on to the next cast. Now, besides the fact that you can get worms out of the sand in different ways, you can also prepare and keep them in different ways too something we've touched on earlier when talking about keeping skellies in shallow trays of water in a fridge and freezing down black lug. But blow lug are a totally different proposition. So how do you approach that particular subject? Blow lug in the summer, uh, you've really got to use it within 24 hours of it being dug and you can, you, can, you can actually keep them in trays in water but I think in the summertime you're far better off wrapping them in dry newspaper and keeping them in a carrier bag. Winter time it's a different ball game because you can keep the blow lug either in water in trays or as I've described in newspaper and you could probably get away with three days with them. It's purely down to the fact that it's all about the temperature in summer when it's very warm, like a lot of the baits, they go off very quickly. But in winter time you can certainly keep them a lot longer. So blow lug then can be trench dug, whereas black lug and skellies live in potentially deep vertical burrows well down the shore and need to be extracted individually. In both these cases, there are factors that can either assist or work against you in getting a result, such as rain, for example, washing away the casts. Give us a rundown then on what can either make or break a worm gathering session on the beach. Regarding blow lug, it's not really an issue because they're very close in, but certain things like the weather will prevent you from getting either the black or the blow lug. I mean, if it's raining heavily, then all the casts are washed away and you can't see them, so there's no point in digging either black or blow lug. In winter time, you've also got to contend with the darkness because when it's dark up until 8 o'clock in the morning and dark at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you would then have to go digging at night time and you obviously need to be equipped with a headlight and all the necessary waterproof uh, gear in case it is raining or in, in case it's very cold. The better worms are on the bigger tides, so I'm talking about tides that are 28 foot up to 33 foot high. Um, that's when you will get the better quality of worms and you will get more sand being uncovered by the tide going out and therefore you'll access more worm beds. On smaller tides, between 22 to 28 foot, the gathering of black and yellow tails becomes a lot harder because there's not as much sand exposed and in the colder times of winter, the worms don't cast, they tend to hibernate, so therefore you won't be able to collect as many worms. And the same applies to the, the blow lug. Although you can get them on all uh, heights of tide, when it gets to winter time, the casts tend to disappear because again the worms hibernate and you'll only find a few casts. Anyone spending a lot of time on the same piece of shore, probably without even thinking about it, should become aware of even the more subtle changes taking place, and as such may well be able to interpret and predict events in a way that others probably couldn't. Give us an insight then, from a bait gathering perspective, on how best to read the beach. Well on the beach you don't dig uh, these worms where there's mussel beds, or cockle beds, or stone beds or where it's, um, there's rocks, because you wouldn't be able to get your pump and your fork into the bed, so you've got to look for a clear stretch of sand with no obstructions on it, and certainly none of the things that I've described. You need to have good clear sand for your pump to go in very quickly to get the worms out. So you could do a, a search pattern as the tide's going out, and I would certainly go two hours before low water to make sure that you've checked the area of the beach and that you don't come across any of the obstructions I've described. What about areas of very wet beach or even standing water? Presumably, this won't present the same degree of problems if you're pumping as opposed to years ago when everyone relied on digging. Sometimes, the, the, if you come across pools, you will come across lots of yellowtail casts and black lug casts, and the water sometimes is a great help to getting the worm out because your pump will go into the sand a lot easier and you will be able to suck the worm out a lot easier. The water will definitely help the pump uh, glide into the sand, and sometimes it does work. Sometimes the opposite happens, and the worms can actually go a lot further down. So 
you've got to try it. If you see casts in the water, then I'd definitely give it a try. If you're getting the worms out, I'd stay with it. If not, then I'd move on to dry sand. I wouldn't even attempt to dig blow lug in water because you'd defeat the object because in addition to digging out the sand, you, you wouldn't remove too much sand from a watery type of area. You mentioned there uh, looking for the cats. Now, presumably, there are going to be areas of overlap on the beach, either between skellies and blow lug, or even black lug and blow lug. Obviously, if it's bait for the freezer you're looking for, you won't want to be wasting any time gathering up blow lug or skellies that you can't keep. With blow lug tending to be further up the beach, this crossover problem is mainly going to be confined to black lug and skellies. How, then, can you differentiate between the casts of each? That's mission impossible, because they both make the same cast. They're either a big cast, or they're a small cast. Usually both the casts have eye holes in the, in the middle, and you cannot differentiate between a skelly yellowtail cast or a black cast until you've got the worm out. So until you've pumped maybe a dozen worms and found out what particular species are there, you won't know the answer to that question. But if the bait is to be used fresh, in which case skellies will do, were these overlap with the blow lug, is it possible to differentiate between these two? Uh, most assuredly, because the blow lug casts, they have a big blow hole, which usually matches up to a cast, which is usually quite large, with squiggly sorts of small, they look like worms, but they're all, it's like a, a bowl of knitting, really, and that usually matches up to a blow hole, whereas the black casts tend to be more condensed and very similar to like a, an ice, the top of an ice cream cone, usually with a, a breather hole in the middle of it. Currently, black lug and skellies are invariably extracted using pumps, but back in the good old bad old days, both would have had to have been dug using a specialist spade. Can we now explore the plus and minus points of these two approaches in terms of productivity, damage to individual worms, and as a consequence of both these factors, potential impact to the marine environment? The older bait diggers who used to be on the spades would say that you wouldn't do as much damage with the spades, although it was a lot harder and you had to get on your hands and knees to get the worms out and go right up to the length of your arm, which is like two and a half foot to three feet deep. It was certainly a lot colder digging with a spade, but every worm that you got would be intact and undamaged. You would not do any damage to any of the bay or too much of the environment. As opposed to now digging with a pump, sometimes you can damage the worms, you can split them or damage them when you're sucking them out. Sometimes you'll only get the tails, sometimes you'll only get half the body. So if you don't get the full worm out, then obviously you're doing a lot of damage to the worms. Although in terms of numbers, with a spade you would probably get a few hundred, maybe up to say two to three hundred with a spade. With the pump, if you really want to work out it and put the time in, you could come off probably with four, five, six hundred worms. And to back that up, you've dug with the spade yourself. I've dug with a spade in the past and it's certainly a lot harder, it's certainly a lot wetter, it's certainly a lot colder, whereas with the pump you're drier, you're warmer and you're not getting your hands cold and you're not getting your hands dirty like you would do with the spade. For those who have neither seen nor used a worm spade, can you explain to us what these look like and how they have to be adapted from what starts life as a garden tool? It's very similar to a garden spade in the sense of the upper part of the uh, spade itself, but when you come to the metal at the bottom, the actual spade itself, it's a tapered design and it goes from something like two or three inches at the bottom up to no broader than six inches at the top and it, it's tapered so as you can cut the sand out very quickly because these worms do move at speed and you need, when you're digging with one of these spades, you need to be getting in moving the sand out quickly and at speed because the worm will, with the, having the water shoots on the side, it goes off at a really fast rate of knots and um, you have to be very quick digging them out. Thinking back to when I used to dig, which I have to say wasn't often and was really successful, after cutting the blade to shape and size, I then heated up the metal where the shaft would go in with a blowtorch to straighten it, then refitted the wooden shaft and handle later. The the idea is that you don't want any kinks at all in the spade. It's got to be straight and narrow to go in literally like a javelin straight into the sand. So if you've got any bumps in the spade, you could actually use a blowtorch as described to take it out or get someone with a, a lathe to straighten it out. 
To get Blacklock out with a spade is a very skilful job with a set of rules which need to be followed rigidly if you're not to end up knackered with nothing more to show for your efforts than yellow fingers and a pile of tails. Yeah, as you as you were slicing off the sand, once you'd cut off maybe half a dozen slices and got to the right depth, you would then see the hole in the burrow, you'd see the entrance hole in the sand, and the idea is that as soon as you see it, you put your fingers or your hand, if possible, into the hole, and it would run along the length of the worm until you'd actually worked your way along its body, and when you'd got a, a decent amount of worm, not the tail, because you are quite easy to snap, you could then pull the body out and it would be intact. You wouldn't do any damage to the worm at all and you get a full worm out. To complete the picture, can you now give us the lowdown on worm pumps? Though the pumps come in all different sizes, you tend to get the smaller guys will have a pump at 28 inches, but the taller guys like myself would have a pump that could possibly run up to 36 inches or even longer than that. You have the sleeve of the pump, you have a handle on the side of the pump, you have a breather hole just below the handle to insert liquid into the pump, which some guys use oil, but most of the people I know use um, washing up liquid. The rod runs through the shaft of the pump, it has a handle at the top, and you use the breather hole to insert the washing up liquid to lubricate the rod so as it runs freely, because they can seize up if you don't keep them lubricated. Inside at the bottom, is the equipment that allows you to get the suction of your pump and this usually comprises metal or plastic washers which are the first part then you put your rubbers in and then you have either a sponge or a lot of people now use silicon these are all circular both the sponge and the silicon are circular which are inserted over the bottom end of the rod and slide probably on the bottom inch and a half of the pump you have a combination of the metal washers, the sponge or the silicon, the rubbers, and at the end it's either a butterfly type clip or a, a screw itself, which you tighten with a, a small socket implement, or with a butter clip you obviously tighten it with your fingers. Um, by tightening up the screw or tightening up the butterfly screw, you apply pressure to the sponge and to the silicon and to the washers and depending on the depth of the worm is whether you have the pressure on full that's tightened up as much as possible or whether you slacken it off if the worms are not over deep you can slacken the pressure off and they're easy to get out and what's your preference for lubricating the pump do you go for vegetable oil or would you prefer furry liquid don't like using the vegetable oils because i think the particles of sand tend to stick to the rod, so I'm a great believer in using the Just use a cheap washing up liquid. When the first pumps reached the UK from Australia, they had large diameter tubes, but progressively they become narrower and narrower. There are obviously advantages to be had from using a small diameter pump, but equally there are disadvantages too. Can you enlighten us on that score? The advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. In the original Olvi pump, when it was first brought out in the 80s, they were used for sucking crabs out of pools of water in Australia, and the bore of these pumps was just like drain pipes. They were two inches or more across the width of the pump, across the diameter, and you had to push that pump or attempt to suck the worms out with a pump, and it was very hard work on your back, and you could not get the pump into any great depth. You was lucky if you could get six inches of the pump into the sand because of the, the width of the diameter of the pump and the, the size of it, it was, uh, it was like pushing a tank into the sand. Nowadays, the diameter's gone from two inches to one and a half to an inch. Some guys actually have pumps now that are half an inch. Now, they are a lot easier to get these smaller pumps into the sand, easy to push in, easy to suck out. With the older pump, you could more or less guarantee to get the worm that you went for because it had a lot more suction in it. But the smaller pumps, because they go into the sand easier, sometimes you can go past the worms. Sometimes you might have to go after a hell of a lot more casts than you would do with the wider bore pump because with a wider bore pump, you'd be taking out more sand, more likely to get the worm in one pump than you would with these smaller pumps because although they've got suction in them they haven't got as great a suction and you do need to go for more casts to get the worms out as opposed to the winded board pump. 
Do you not find, though, that you end up damaging more worms? You do damage more worms with a narrower pump because you tend to miss them, whereas the wider bore pump was more accurate in the sense it was pulling out more sand and nine times out of ten it would get the worm out. Using the narrow pump, would the angle of approach be a factor in missing, damaging or actually getting the worm? It would do because it would not be as precise as the wider board pump, but it's certainly a lot more easier on the back, on the arms and on the body than the wider board pump. It's definitely a lot easier to use and certainly not as damaging on your own body. Now, as with a lot of things in this life, there can be different operational approaches to getting the same result. Is that also true of worm pumping, or is there a set pattern to it, particularly in terms of starting distance from the cast and the angle the pump goes in? Tell us how you approach a black lug cast with your pump. Well, I would say that every bait digger has got a different way of getting the worms out of the beach. No one action will continually sustain you getting the worms out. The worms change all the time. Sometimes they're shallow, sometimes they're mid-shallow, sometimes they're very deep. Um, the action of the tide also determines the depth that, that the worm uh, lives at. Sometimes before low water it's very shallow, sometimes it's very deep. Contrary to that, sometimes when the tide's coming in they can either be deep or shallow. What I tend to do is I'll go after a certain number of worms and the same technique will be good, That i.e. I'll go in at the same angle i'll go in at the same depth and i'll get the worm but at some stage during the digging the worm will change it will either go shallow it will go deeper and then i have to change my technique accordingly and either go closer to the cast further away from the cast shallower or deeper depending on what depth the worm it has it does change all the time through a two-hour session of digging the worms do not stay at the same angle the same depth you just have to change accordingly, and this only comes with experience. Obviously, everyone has to learn, and for a newcomer, getting proficient is going to be a very steep learning curve. But equally, it's also going to take its toll on the worm beds, both through extra takeaway pressure and through worms that are missed but later die in the sand. They'll certainly miss more than what they get, and they'll certainly damage more than what they get, because they'll probably only get the tail of the worm or a small part of the body, so... As regards people learning, the only thing I can suggest with them is, you know, time makes perfect, so you've just got to get your head round it and get on with it until you make sure that you've got, you know, 20 or 30 worms for fishing. It will come with practice, and there's nothing that can be done as regards people starting off and just getting a few tails and just getting bits of bodies, but it will come with practice, and once you've got managed to get 20, then it's happy days, then you can go doing your fishing. Is there not a danger then that with pumps now freely available to both experts and novices, that for both those reasons, currently viable worm beds could start to decline? Certainly, I've not found that to be the case because you would think sometimes when I go digging, there are lots of people on the beach. They're either digging to go fishing, uh, whether it be boat fishing or beach fishing, and there's also people digging on the beach to sell worms. But I've been doing it now for 20 years and the bait beds seem to survive no matter how many people are digging bait or not. They seem to have a wonderful recovery rate and they must breed at a tremendously fast pace. But I don't think anyone's done any research into bait beds. I am aware of bait bands in places like Barrow and on the northeast coast, but they seem to leave them for something like two years and then at the end of that time, the bait beds have come back to the same amount of density as what they were before the ban. You don't see any value then in bed resting or bed rotation. It replenishes quickly enough to do so of its own accord. Well, it's certainly been my experience that that's been the case. I think what happens is that when it gets to winter time, when it gets to October through to March, I think that's when the worms do a lot of breeding and it's self-protection, the fact that they're breeding during the winter time, and therefore, because you don't see as many casts, that seems to help the bait beds to recover all the time. Moving on a bit now, whether you're digging or pumping, hopefully worms will end up on top of the wet sand. Talk us through the next stage in the process. Regarding blow lug, then uh, when I collect them on the beach, they're kept in a bucket, 
I washed them off a couple of times in fresh sea water to get all the sand off them. Take the blow lug uh, back home. I either keep them in trays in water, which is what I do in winter time, in just probably about half an inch of water, or the best way I found of keeping them is to wrap them in dry newspaper, keep them in a carrier bag, place them in the fridge, and they then tend to firm up. In the summer, they're better off being used within 24 hours. In the winter, you can probably keep the blow lug for maybe 48 hours or maybe even a little bit longer. The yellowtails in the summer, I collect them and I keep them in a bucket without holes in, take them back home, transfer them into um, litter trays uh, or cat's trays, change the seawater every day. In summertime, I can keep them alive in water for probably up to maybe two or three days in winter time i can keep them alive for up to a fortnight um, the black log when i've dug them in the summer i put them in a bucket that has got holes in it i wash all the blood and guts out of the worms because if you didn't uh, the worms would turn to jelly they just emulsify and the blood and guts which contain iodine would run down the body of the worm and it would just become a mushy jellified bowl of slush so i make sure that they're gutted properly because they firm up and go quite hard and strong in summer i would take them home stick them in wrap them in dry newspaper put them in a carrier bag and keep them in the fridge i can keep them for up to five days in winter time i can do exactly the same with the black worms i can keep them for probably up to 10 days before i would have to freeze them down Gutting is important regardless of whether you intend to fridge or freeze black lug. Most will burst or partially gut themselves naturally, even if you don't give them a squeeze, and will then soon start to go off, even if they're going to be used on the same day. So gutting needs to be done properly. What is the best way then to be sure they are gutted as well as they can be? What I do is either squeeze the head or tap the head on the pump. I also shake the worm to make sure that the guts and the blood have gone, gone out of them and you can actually feel the worm go hard in your hand it's at that point that i know to throw it in the bucket once it's gone firm and hard i know i've got the blood and guts out of it and it's ready for either using fresh or freezing uh, when i freeze them down what i do is i roll them in dry sand and either wrap them in newspaper or wrap them in cling film wraps and insert them in a plastic bag for freezing down and the concept of the dry sand is that the worm because you've taken the blood and guts out, it contracts. But when you roll it in the dry sand, it actually elongates and goes back to more or less its original length. But more importantly, it then inflates and goes like your finger. And it stays like that in the freezing down process. And whether the worms are in paper or in cling film wraps, I make sure that they're done in dried sand. And the worm will then dry up in the sand. And then when the anglers are using the bait, when it starts to thaw out either in the paper or in the backpacks, you're ground baiting instantly because you've all the body juices of the worm in the sand. When you get the worms home, having been washed off in seawater and left piled up on top of each other, even though the bucket has drain holes, they are presumably going to still be quite wet. Do you make any attempt at drying them off, such as spreading them out on newspaper for a few minutes, or do you go straight on to the next stage? I go straight for the sand because what you'll find is if you was to leave the worms overnight they would contract and go shorter and shorter and an 8 inch worm after 24 hours would probably go down to about 5 inches so I freeze them down immediately so as they keep the same length as when they came out of the ground. Right, but because I never coated mine in sand I would give them an hour or so to dry off then wrap them in a medium gloss paper such as a TV guide which is less absorbent than plain newspaper. So presumably then, sand gets around this extra level of preparation. That's fair comment that, because um, as I've just described, you'll notice that when you bring the worms back, and as opposed to rolling them in the strand, you can definitely see, when you roll them in dry sand, you can actually see them grow back to the original length, and you can actually see them inflate and go like your finger. But when I'm freezing down, I make sure that those worms are frozen down. Within hours of me digging the bait, the worms are frozen down. I'm not waiting about ready to keep them for the next day. I'll freeze them down immediately so as they go down in pristine condition and in virtually the same length and size as when they came out of the ground. In the past, 
I used to be able to get frozen black lug packaged up using an industrial strength vacuum packer, which literally sucked every scrap of air out of the bag before heat sealing it closed. And not only did those worms come out in perfect condition, but they would also last literally for years. That's the first uh, rate way of keeping them. And I have a machine that um, actually it seals the bags. It doesn't suck out the air. But I think so long as you've got them in a bag that keeps the cold air away from the worm, then that is an ideal way of keeping them for literally forever. I take it then that you hand squeeze out the air as much as you can without squashing the bait before sealing the pack shut. Yeah, I do press I press the bag down so as when it's, it's being sealed there is a certain amount of air coming out of the bag, yes. I suppose the ultimate way of laying down bait would be to do all the preparation you've already described, followed by the vac packing, then dip them into liquid nitrogen for instant freezing. I've never thought of that, I've never used that, so I can't answer that question. I've no doubt that there would be all sorts of safety as well as cost restrictions, though many large companies currently use it for a variety of engineering procedures. Normal slow freezing creates tiny sharp ice crystals within the cells of once living tissue, which punctures the walls, causing them later to leak, and it's this which causes frozen foods to go soft when thawed. Liquid nitrogen freezing, on the other hand, is so quick that these crystals don't get to form and cause such damage. You might be right about that, but then I suppose there's a cost implication because you're going to have to buy the liquid nitrogen as well, and, and store it as well if you've got the facility. I had intended to treat blowlugs separately from the black and the skellies with their own set of questions, but answers to most of those have already been given by way of comparisons as we've gone along. One aspect, however, which hasn't been touched on yet, is long-term keeping. Popping them into the fridge for a few days is one thing. Having live blowlug available for weeks on end is quite another matter, and one which used to be dealt with by setting up saltwater tanks with aeration equipment. These were particularly popular back in the 1980s, but in my experience, tank lug were never as good in catching terms as the ones that were taken straight from the beach. Have you had any experiences at all of long-term tanking of lugworms? I am aware of some people who actually keep lugworms in fish tanks with aerators in and they've got sand in the bottom of the tanks so as the worms can bury themselves into it. But you're quite right, they don't seem to keep the same natural vibrancy as they do when you're using them when they come straight out of the ground. It's probably because a fish tank is not a natural environment to the ordinary beach where they would be eating all sorts of microscopic organisms that would be on the beach in the, in the sea water and in the sand, whereas in a fish tank, I suppose, eventually it gets depleted of whatever it is they're going to feed on. And there's nothing there to keep the bodies in any sort of pristine condition because it would be the same seawater, the same oxygen and the same sand. So any goodness that was in the sand, I've no doubt, would have been abstracted by the worms within the days of the sand being put in the tank. So the bodies cannot be in as good condition as what they were in a natural environment. So they're obviously more watery and the bodies are, are not as strong as if they were in their own sort of sandy environment. I suppose the question to some extent answers itself by the fact that nobody seems to bother doing it anymore these days. I'm aware of one person who does actually have a shop in Bridlington and he keeps the blow lug, which is dug locally in fish tanks, but because he's close to the sea and because it's an actual bait, the bait is being sold on a regular daily, weekly basis and therefore the worms are not kept for, let's say, weeks or months on end. They're virtually used within the week, the dugs, therefore they're not suffering from the sort of condition that I described earlier in the interview. One final comment on the worms. When you're digging, as with any bait, some of what you gather is inevitably going to be damaged. But that doesn't mean that these worms are of no use. They can still be used for bulking up with whole worms, or even the small baits in their own right. The problem is that putting them in with the good stuff can be disastrous. How then do you go about dealing with damaged worms? The damaged ones, you have to remove them from the ones that are intact, and just keep them separately in newspaper, take them don't keep them in the water in the trays that the uh, the good worms are in and just keep them in newspaper. You don't even have to wrap them in tens. You can just put all the bits in a couple of pieces of newspaper and just insert them into the 
carrier bag uh, and make sure that the paper sweats in the carrier bag and providing they're used I'd say within 24 hours of being damaged they're, they're okay as baits. Can we now switch our attention to ragworms? I know this is not a bait that is either as regularly dug or used as lugworms certainly along the Lancashire coast but it is nonetheless quite a popular and at times very productive bait. Have you had any experience of gathering rag? Well, the ragworm beds at Fleetwood were dug out in the 40s and 50s. However, in the local boating lake, the marine lake, it's drained once a year, and I have dug uh, ragworms in the lake. In springtime, particularly in April, when I've been up to the lakeside, I've seen all these um, large green ragworms on the top of the surface in the seagulls dive bombing to collect them and eat them. And what it is, these worms are actually breeding and they're dying at the same time because if I've, I've tried to use them for bait, um, there's been very little in them and they've, they've just gone to jelly on the hook, but they are the big green worms. And what happens with the local uh, lake at Fleetwood is it has an outfall pipe and on the big tides, it sucks in fresh seawater to replenish the lake when it's been drained and you get all sorts of creatures being sucked in through these pipes, fish and also ragworms. And when the lake is drained, usually in the month of December, I've been into the lake and I've dug ragworm, which consists of the giant king rag, which are green, and they're the breeding worms, and they can grow up to anything up to two feet long. And then alongside those, you've also got the smaller worms, which are in excellent condition. They're a red colour, probably six to twelve inches long. And those are ragworms that are superb bait for um, sea fishing. As regards the conditions in the lake, there's two sorts of terrain. There's hard clay type mud, which they live in. But the red ragworms, they seem to live in sort of bright golden sand that's at the top on the sides of the lake. And that's been my only experience of um, the ragworms. I was going to ask you about terrain, actually. Ragworms are not distributed nearly so widely around the country as lugworms, suggesting more specific requirements which perhaps most typical beaches are unable to satisfy. Whenever I've dug them in the past, it's either been in harbours or estuaries, with plenty of stones and stinking organic muddy sand, not the easiest nor the pleasantest of places to dig. But what I've also found in these and other harbour situations are areas where there are lots of smaller worms in the really heavy, claggy areas of muddy sand. The worms you just described are harbour rag and there's millions of those in Fleetwood at the side of the dock walls and in the harbour itself and they live in sticky, claggy, smelly mud and when you use a fork to dig them they're only small, they're bright red but you can finish up gathering hundreds of them and you would need probably a dozen or more to put on a small hook to catch the flounders of the fish that you're going for. There's also another type of worm that lives further down the river the river wire and that's creeper rag which is a similar sort of worm to the harbour rag but it's bigger it probably is maybe two to three inches long it's a very strong firm body and again it's a ready coloured worm and the terrain that that lives in it lives in like gravel it's very stony gravelly ground and when you're digging them with like a garden fork they're in this shaly, gravelly ground and they're very, very firm, whereas the harbour rag that I previously described, they live in a very muddy, slimy, stinky condition and they're a, they're a far smaller worm and they're a ready coloured worm as well. And presumably, all ragworms are dug with the fork. You can't use pumps on ragworms because you just smash them to smithereens. So even though some of them are firm, they're such a small worm and some of them are so delicate, no way could you attempt to acquire them with a pump. And when you've got them out of the ground, how do you treat them in terms of cleaning and preparation for the fridge? You can give them a wash off, but because they're so small, these ragworms, you'll never ever get the, it's the mud, it's not sand, it's mud, and mud will cling to the body. So I found the best way of keeping them is to put them into, into sheets of newspaper and just allow them to, um, dry off and they do some of the the mud that they're in it does come off and you'll find even when you're fishing there will still be certain amounts of mud sticking to the worm but the best way to keep them is to keep them in newspaper and again keep them in the fridge in a carrier bag to keep them a little bit moist 
you can't keep these worms in, wa in water. You've got to keep them in newspaper. Whenever I've dug rag for myself, it's always been for same day use. So I've separated them off into maybe half dozens, and as you say, wrapped them in a couple of sheets of newspaper. But whenever I've bought rag worms, because they could be lying around in the tackle shop for a few days and more, these have always been kept in either peat or vermiculite, which to me looks like crumbled tree bark made from polystyrene. That's a good way of, of keeping them. You can buy farmed ragworms, and they, you're quite right, they're kept in vermiculite, and that's an excellent way of keeping the worms. And uh, if you do resort to buying them from the shops like that, I do suggest you keep the vermiculite for you know, any future supplies that you do gather yourself. So what does it do for them that simple newspaper wrapping can't? Does it toughen them, keep them cool, or just keep them moist? I think it does all those things. It's a, a resilient sort of material that the worms seem to thrive on, and it certainly keeps them clean, it keeps them fresh, keeps them moist, so it's whatever is in the vermiculite, and I can't begin to tell you an answer to what it is in, in that that actually keeps the worms so fresh. You mentioned a few moments ago farming ragworms, which has been going on for many years now. In fact, I visited the sea bait complex when it first opened, and I have to say, I was really impressed. What farming offers is constant quality, constant size, and of course, constant supply. But as with the tank lugworm keeping which we touched on earlier, while fish will take them, somehow, perhaps because the pellet fed, something seems to be lacking by comparison to worms taken from the natural environment. Well, I think that's exactly the case. I think you've said it as it is, really, because with something that's farmed, it's the same with the farm blow lug, the farm ragworm. They're nowhere near as good as the wild, as the natural uh, sort of worm. And it equates to the same with the fish. If you've ever had farm cod or farm bass, nowhere will it taste the same as wild bass or, or wild cod. And it's the same with the worms because they're induced in a... In a probably not the same as the natural environment. They don't seem to fish as well as what the wild stuff does. If you can get wild stuff, uh, I would say you're far better using that than you are the, the farm stuff. But when supplies are running out, which they may well be of ragworms, then you've got to resort to, to something to keep the anglers happy and you, you need to farm the worms. Finally, there is one other species of ragworm which is a must on the shore match angling scene, that being the white rag. I've even heard it referred to as white gold. That's a measure of how highly those in the know rate it. The problem is that it isn't an easy bait to get hold of. You do come across the odd one occasionally while digging for other things. That said, I also hear that there are areas where they form beds. What are your thoughts and experiences on this particular subject? Well, the white rag bags locally, certainly in Fleetwood, don't exist. Occasionally when I'm at wire light digging, I do come across probably a six-inch white ragworm, but not in any great numbers, it's just the odd one. And when I've been digging at Blackpool, certainly on big tides, on the very big tides, there do appear to be white rag beds close to the uh, low water mark. And it's not a it's not a worm that's acquiring great quantities locally because... There doesn't seem to be the white ragworm beds here, whereas if you go to places like Scotland, there are plenty of white rag beds there, and the worms could grow up to as long as 12 inches or even more, and they're quite thick as well. But it's not a worm that's found uh, really on this coastline. But if they were here, you'd still dig them with a fork in much the same way as the other ragworm species. The problem being that in most areas, they do tend to be spaced out much further apart. Or would that not necessarily be the case if you find a bed? If you're lucky enough to find one uh, locally, I'm sure there will be at Blackpool. There will be white rag beds there, and I think you will find them in numbers, but you would only be able to get to them on the big tides, the, probably the 31-foot-plus tides up to 33s, and they would be in reasonably-sized beds. And there are some Blackpool anglers who I think do know where these beds are, but they're not silly enough to disclose it to a bait digger in case they were dug on a continual basis. So I think if you're lucky enough to find a, a bed of white rag, then keep it to yourself and uh, and don't tell anyone else about it. And if you are lucky enough to stumble across a great pile of the things, what's the best way of treating and keeping them? They seem to keep them in trays, in cap trays, uh, in the fridge with just a small amount of seawater in. I haven't heard of them wrapping white rag in newspaper. Just keep them in the trays and, again, check them daily. 
change the water daily and any ones that have died then use them for fishing straight away. And are white ragworms really as special as some people make out? Or is it just a rarity thing? Or perhaps even nothing more than having an extra weapon in your armoury that you hope your competitors might not have? Do they actually have the ability to catch fish where other baits won't? They seem to be preferred by the matchmen. I think it's probably two things. One is firstly it's a live bait as opposed to a dead bait. When you put the worm on the hook, it's alive and kicking. It's like a small snake. It's got a good body length on it. So there's plenty of movement in the water, in the body. And the other thing is, with it being white, I think white must be a colour that transfers itself to the sea quite easily. And maybe maybe the fish can see white as opposed to black and browns and reds of the other worms that I've described. It may be the smell as well that exudes from the worm, but I'd certainly think it's the, the size of the worm. They are big worms, and there's plenty of movement in them. I'd also like to mention the fact that there are numerous other species of marine worm which fish will be only too happy to feed on, given the chance. The fact that these are not as available, nor as keepable as the species we've already covered here, is undoubtedly the main reason why they're not targeted by anglers and diggers. That said... I had tried a few of these things over the years, in particular one called Ophelia by Cornis, which is only known by its Latin name, though I have occasionally heard them referred to as half-chats and aliens in the past. When pricked with the hook, they pour out a sort of thick, sticky, watery, clay-like fluid. Do you think there are possibly other types of worms out there in the wild, which diggers and anglers could exploit? Well, I've not come across the worms you've just described. I do know when I'm digging, sometimes I do see... Not big worms, but small, very small worms, which must be attractive to flounders and possibly codling and bass. But they're actually in the first 12 inches of the sand. And they're very small worms, certainly no bigger than half an inch to an inch long. But I don't know. I don't know what they're called, but it's like anything else. There must be plenty of different types of worms of different sizes that I've got no knowledge of. To bring the interview to a close now, having already touched on sustainability, self-regulation and self-regeneration, do you foresee a time in the future when legislation will be brought in to control bait gathering? In some parts of the country, local authorities are already exerting pressure on anglers and diggers. Marine conservation areas look likely to be the next big topic on the agenda. Bait farming, fortunately, lies outside the control of such bodies, but for the reasons already given, Cultured bait may not be enough in terms of quality and quantity to satisfy demand. What then is your vision of that particular future? I think there are moves afoot to try and counter what's happening in the environment and uh, I'm certainly aware that the uh, one of the marine agencies is setting up something like half a dozen different areas throughout the country to protect all sorts of things like wildlife, fishing and things like mussels, cockles and worms but whether it'll ever come into reality i don't know because man is a hunter and the certainly the bait digging and the fishing has gone on from time immemorial and i'd like to think that uh, they wouldn't license either sea fishing or bait digging because i think the environment itself is able to continually produce certainly enough bait to provide the fishermen for uh, future years to come but i am aware it is a concern and that, uh, it could come into being in the future The biggest problem they've got with it is how the hell are they going to police it? Well, you certainly give us a lot to think about there in terms of self-supply and what might be looming in the future, not all of which may turn out to be good, and I'm grateful for that. Well, some of it at least. At the time of recording this interview, it's July 2011, and I can't help but wonder how long into the future it will be before the restrictions on beach access for fishing, for digging, and for small boat launching will become so great as to persuade the vast majority of anglers to call it a day. I hope that doesn't happen, because despite taking a few fish for the table, most anglers act as guardians of the marine environment, always fighting for better managed fish stocks, and willing to practice conservation as a natural part of whatever it is they do without having to be told. My thanks then to Dave Christie, for sharing his thoughts and his experiences with us here. 